Good afternoon, folks. Thank you so much for joining today. Some United Ways from across uh, Southern Louisiana, across the capital area and into Southeast Louisiana, United Way of Southeast Louisiana and the capital area of United Way. We're so grateful to be here today with our friends at Southeast Louisiana Legal Services to bring with you some really important information you need to know. I, I to say in advance of hurricane season, but it's here. We know it's here because as the waters are warm and we spent last week watching the disturbance that didn't form over the Gulf and let's hope hurricane season stays that way. But unfortunately, there's a lot of business we need to take care of when it comes to legal issues around disaster services. And unfortunately, we also are uh, wildly ill-prepared, I come to find out, as we prepared for today's webinar. So I want to thank you all for joining us as folks come in the room. Uh, reminder, just a few housekeeping notes for today. Um, this webinar is being recorded, so if you have any technical difficulties on your end, um, we will share this out uh, in a follow-up email. Um, and again, we ask you to, uh, you'll, you'll stay on mute, all participants, all attendees will be on mute throughout the duration of uh, today's webinar, but you will be able to engage um, if the questions using our chat feature or through a question and answer segment that we'll have at the end of today's presentation time permitting. And so with that, it's my honor to introduce a, a couple of individuals that are going to give you a brief welcome uh, today, give you some information as to why we're joining here together as United Ways, uh, United Way of Southeast Louisiana President and CEO Michael Williamson, and the President and CEO of United Way of Capital Area George Bell. And with that, I'll uh, introduce Michael and, and let you take it away. Thank you, Michael. Well, thanks, Kirby. It's officially afternoon, so good afternoon. Um, and thank everybody for joining us. I think this may be one of the most popular webinars that, they, that we've conducted. And so we're excited to be with you. Um, let me start with a, a first a thank you. I wanna thank all of you for being here, of course, but also my good friend, our good friend, Mr. George Bell, the CEO of the Capital Area United Way. And of course, longtime partner of United Way um, across the board, I believe, Laurel Tug Laura Tuggle, who serves as the executive director of Southeast Louisiana Legal Services. And so thank you all. Um, here it is, hurricane season, you know, about a month and a half in, and I imagine we're all waiting with bated breath, I hope for a calm season, but if not, we need to be prepared, and the time to actually prepare is uh, right now. You know, there are many facets to a disaster. Um, we've had a lot of experience, but oftentimes matters of legal importance often get overlooked, and we're here to help you prepare um, for that so that you don't look, overlook really, really important legal matters that you should be paying attention to well before a disaster. And we know it's important that we take the necessary steps to protect ourselves and our loved ones, um, including getting your legal affairs in order. So United Way of Southeast Louisiana, Capital Area, United Way, and many more United Way partners across the state, I believe, um, are here to help before, during, and after the storm. You saw in that initial welcoming slide, you know, we're boots on the ground, we move at the speed of need, but once the boots on the ground are done, it's time to have suits on the ground to start helping you with um, your legal challenges you may face in the wake of a storm. We're really honored and um, pleased to be able to do this in partnership with our friends at the Capital Area United Way um, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So I'm pleased to welcome my good friend, our good friend, Mr. George Bell, President and CEO of the Capital Area United Way. Well, Michael, uh, thank you for that warm introduction, my friend. Uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, serve alongside uh, our colleagues at South uh, Southeast Louisiana, uh, United Way of Southeast Louisiana. Um, let me just first start by saying uh, Capital Area United Way has funded uh, Southeast Legal Services uh, really since its inception. Uh, uh, the disaster hotline uh, that you guys operate is a very vital part of uh, the response uh, resources that are available in our communities. And uh, as an annual program grantee, we were confident that Southeast Legal, uh, Southeast Louisiana Legal uh, Services had the right talent and knowledge in place to get important information to the Alice population. With disasters come many changing local and federal mandates and regulations. And we are proud to support uh, uh, this organization in spreading resources for households to overcome legal barriers to the basic needs. Also, we're, we're you know, Capital Area United Way is, part of, is proud to be a part of the 211 
uh, statewide network of uh, uh, information referral and crisis services, uh, focusing uh, particularly on our region. Uh, during times of disaster, we partner with local and statewide government uh, to ensure residents are armed with the information they need pre, during, and post disaster uh, into long recovery, long term recovery. So the numbers speak for themselves. Uh, the call volumes uh, during disasters uh, usually spike, and uh, we've seen it firsthand. Uh, at our, uh, uh, in our region, and I'm sure other regions have experienced that as well. Uh, but it is good to be in a position where we can help folks uh, when the need is at its greatest. So thank you all for uh, your support and continued support. And to Laura, uh, thank you for the wonderful work that you guys do. Uh, we are proud to be a, a sponsoring partner of that work. And we uh, uh, look forward to uh, you know, if duty calls uh, this hurricane season, we look forward to all being able to uh, roll up our sleeves and be uh, there for our uh, respective communities. So thank you for this opportunity to be a part of this. Thanks so much, George and Michael. Laura, we'll uh, kick it off to you at this point. You can take us away and know so much important information. And, uh, and I do believe I turned over the screen sharing uh, capabilities to you at this point. So be able to pull your deck up. And folks, as a reminder, second. Oh, go ahead. As a reminder, uh, again, if you have questions as they're going throughout today's presentation, you can use that uh, uh, question, answer, or chat function to put those in there. And, and with time permitting, we'll get to them at the conclusion of Laura's presentation. Laura, with that, take it away. Okay. Well, thank you so much, um, Kirby, Michael, George, uh, everybody else on the line. You know, we couldn't do what we do first without an outstanding team that is behind me um, and also the support that we get um, from our United Way partners and other uh, partners throughout the community. Uh, you know, we know that this one um, is the, really the first disaster that we are responding to from all 22 of our parishes that we serve all at the same time. Uh, every parish we serve was part of the Hurricane Ida disaster declaration. So we're both in the response mode and probably will be for three to five years, depending upon uh, what part of our service area we're in. And then we're also gearing up and preparing for what may be coming. So we really appreciate you giving us this opportunity. Um, and it turns out that I was just told that we had 140 people registered. So apparently this is actually news that hopefully people can use. Um, and so we've got a few goals for today's session. Uh, one of them being to help you guys identify what the heck do we mean by a disaster related civil legal issue? What is disaster legal services? Uh, secondly, we want you to know where to refer survivors who have unmet legal needs. We want you to know how to access disaster legal services. And we want to do what we can to increase partnership and collaboration. So we know that disaster legal services are really just part and parcel of the services we deliver every day. We know that there are certain kinds of legal issues that are gonna spike when there's a disaster. And there's maybe a few new things that come up like doing FEMA appeals that you won't be doing when there's a, not an active disaster. But we learned after Hurricane Katrina that the ability to respond to disaster and to really kind of build up that knowledge base is part and parcel and critical work of our kind of our ongoing work for low-income people. Next slide. Oh, I'm doing my own slide this time. My prior session, I got someone else to do it. All right, so what is civil legal aid? You may be wondering. Uh, we are a nonprofit legal aid provider. We are currently the largest nonprofit legal aid provider in the state. Um, we have seven offices. And um, by the end of probably next month, maybe this month, we'll be up to 175 staff. Pre-COVID, we had 100. So we've had this 
explosion um, in our ability to serve folks um, really brought about by uh, the terrible crises that our, our Alice population is faced uh, with, including the pandemic, disasters, and really the impacts of long-term poverty and um, institutional racism. So we are the nonprofit that covers 22 parishes in Southeast Louisiana. I'm going to show you a map in a minute so you'll have an idea of what that is. Uh, it is definitely all the parishes that the Capital Area United Way serves, and it is all the parishes uh, that the United Way of Southeast Louisiana serves. Our sister agency, Acadiana Legal Services, despite their name, has the rest of the 42 parishes in the state. Our two programs each have about 50% of the poverty population that lives in our service areas. So southern part of the state is got a lot more concentrated poverty um, than Acadiana's region. And so we know that whenever disaster strikes, whether it's a pandemic, a natural disaster, or it could be an individual crisis for a family where maybe they've had a fire um, and have lost their home that civil legal aid can be a really essential component of helping stabilize those families. So th this is a map, it's a slight bit out of date because both Acadiana has added an office and um, we have an outreach office in Luling in St. Charles Parish uh, that doesn't show on here. But SLLS has offices in Baton Rouge, New Orleans, Gretna, Hammond, Homa, Covington, and then our outreach office in Luling. So if you're wondering like what kind of folks can you maybe refer for civil legal aid, um, folks that are low income, we typically use federal poverty guidelines for our general eligibility. So that varies by income size and household size on what those amounts are, but for one person household, it's probably around 16,000 or so. Um, we can also help families that have incomes between 126 to 200 percent of federal poverty guidelines if they have certain kinds of deductions. So if they're paying child support, if they're paying child care, if they uh, have certain out-of-pockets for unreimbursed medical expenses, rent costs or mortgage costs, um, cost to enable them to work or go to school related to transportation can be included, like a car note, insurance, a bus pass, things like that. Um, so a lot of folks, that's often more like the Alice population when you're getting into folks at that income level. And then when disaster strikes, we typically get resources that allow us to uh, potentially go up even higher. So we do have a number of special disaster grants where we can go up to 250% of poverty. And then for seniors, we have some grants um, that don't have income guidelines at all. So it all depends and it's, it's best to just get someone to seek services even if you're not quite sure where they may fall. The other thing that we do, we only do civil legal help in civil cases. So we don't do any criminal matters. The only thing that we do that has to be filed in criminal court are expungements. Um, and we really think it's important to provide services on expungements because it is a barrier to so many different kinds of opportunities around job opportunities, housing, even education. Uh, so we do take on those matters. Um, where they're just filed in criminal court. Um, so the kinds of things that we're typically doing on a day-to-day -day basis is landlord-tenant issues, um, consumer debt problems, um, family law, a divorce, custody, domestic violence issues, uh, helping people get protective orders or otherwise stabilize domestic violence survivors, employment law issues, benefits, disability benefits, FEMA benefits, um, VA benefits, um, helping people with tax issues. And I'm sure I'm leaving something out. <laughs> I, I seem to always do that, but these are kind of the everyday legal challenges um, struggling families face. 
One thing I do want to point out, we don't typically do civil cases where the private bar is really better situated to handle those. So I'll give you a couple of examples. It, you know, car accident cases, slip and fall cases, we don't do those kind of cases. We're really talking about the day-to-day -day kinds of legal challenges where um, families in maybe in crisis are trying to avoid a destabilizing uh, legal problem from upending their lives. And then our legal services are always free. We never charge a client for legal assistance. The only type of cost that a client might have to bear, um, let's say we're filing a succession in court. Uh, there may be a court fee for that, which can't be waived. A lot of times court fees can be waived for lower income people. But there's a few instances where they can't. Um, with most of our disaster grants, we build in those costs because we don't want somebody not being able to get the legal relief they need because they can't afford $150 recordation fee or something like that. So most of the time we're able to fully cover even out of pocket costs, but not 100% of the time. So I wanted to share this slide. I, you know, those of you on this uh, session probably already realize that whenever disaster strikes, it disproportionately impacts special populations, communities of color, tribal communities. Um, folks that are seniors, people living with disabilities. And we have found also a surprisingly a disproportionate impact on veterans as well. So just want to throw this slide together. This shows you some statistics from our, the 2016 um, greater, the floods in greater Baton Rouge. And we noticed in our non-disaster um, non caseload, when it comes to serving seniors, Usually about 15% of our clients are seniors. Um, when it's a disaster going on or immediately after a disaster, that spikes up to almost 30%. When you're talking about people living with disabilities, usually about 19% of our clients in our non-disaster time caseload are people living with disabilities where the head of household is person with a disability. That jumps up to almost 28% too, whenever there's a disaster. And then surprisingly with veterans, um, normally we only have between one to one and a half percent of our caseload being veterans. But when there's a disaster, it jumps up to seven and a half percent, which is pretty astounding. That's like, if my math is right, like a 750% increase. I'm, I'm not really a, a math person, but it's a, it's a pretty tremendous jump. And um, we think part of that is because there's a lot of veterans that own their homes and have a VA home loan. And when there's a disaster, there's so much damage to homes and housing. So hopefully you guys can read this. Uh, it's pretty small. Uh, this is a diagram that we downloaded from, uh, we didn't create this one, but we have found it to be pretty true in our work as well from the National uh, Legal Aid Disaster Resource Center. So there's gonna be in more disasters that aren't as catastrophic in scope as in IDA, uh, there are gonna be some short-term legal issues that pop up in the first six weeks or so. Um, we're way past that. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and jump into the one to six months and six months to, to years. And a lot of these issues start out in the very beginning and then just continue. Um, so the kinds of things that we're really seeing continuing to get a lot of requests for are help with FEMA appeals. You know, we're almost a, a year down the road, but every day we're still getting a lot of requests for folks that were denied assistance or um, they don't think they got as much assistance as they should have received through FEMA or the SBA. On landlord tenant issues, huge. We are still seeing, um, even just compared to where we were before Ida, about a 20% increase in evictions and landlord tenant disputes. And we're in this situation now where because of the pandemic, it's really challenging 
to resolve some of these landlord tenant disputes. If you have someone that's still behind on their rent, it makes it very difficult to get the landlord to say, come in and make some repairs because there's a hole in the roof um, or, or leaks that were caused by the storm that are unaddressed or that have gotten worse. So that dovetail between the COVID issues brought on by the pandemic and where we find ourselves now, um, there is a strong correlation there. So a lot of times folks are having issues with, uh, if they're on subsidized assistance, they may be having some kind of issue uh, with their housing voucher or their public housing subsidy. Um, we are beginning to see spikes in foreclosures. So a lot of times right after a disaster, HUD or the VA will issue a short-term moratorium on foreclosures. Those are usually 90 days or six months. Uh, we, are, we are past that and are definitely beginning to see more folks being faced with potential foreclosures. So we, we try to help them with a loan modification or a forbearance agreement. Um, or sometimes other kinds of legal remedies uh, that we might be able to bring into play. Um, a lot of times at this juncture, we are seeing contractor dispute, disputes, um, shoddy work disputes with contractors, sometimes contractor fraud. Uh, and that is gonna continue from now till probably several more years. Sometimes insurance disputes, although we do pretty much defer to the private bar to handle uh, insurance disputes, we sometimes have to resolve them if they're like part of a FEMA case because your um, compensation from insurance will feed into to a FEMA case in many instances. And then we begin seeing a lot of family law issues. So you wouldn't necessarily think that you would see an increase in domestic violence on the heels of a disaster, but you definitely do. And in both New Orleans and Baton Rouge, we are having tremendous issues with domestic violence, both the severity and the amount of domestic violence survivors uh, that are killed. Um, so I, I can't draw a line-to-line a -line correlation, but anytime there are additional stressors, uh, or disruptions to um, economic stability, or frankly, if there's been very significant decimation to housing stock, a domestic violence survivor who's also impacted by disaster may literally have nowhere else to go. There may be no other housing. Uh, maybe the domestic violence shelter is even damaged, um, and there need to be other options for that. Um, so we do see spikes, uh, and we are definitely seeing more people request our assistance who are also kind of duly impacted by domestic violence and disaster. So the only other thing on the other slide that we haven't really talked about in the first tranche here, uh, a couple of other things, uh, FEMA recoupments. Believe it or not, almost 17 years post-Katrina, we are still getting new FEMA recoupment cases. So that has a really long tail. I'll tell you a little bit more about what a recoupment is in a second. But we also begin sometimes seeing tax lien issues um, and bankruptcies. So a lot of times folks will kind of get overextended on credit cards and credit because they're trying to repair their homes or they're just trying to make it and they've had major disruptions with their home and their um, finances. So uh, <clears throat> sometimes will folks at this juncture, six months to a year later, they may be getting sued by a credit card company. Uh, they may be facing um, needing to do a potential bankruptcy to try to stabilize themselves, whether it's chapter seven for personal debt or chapter 13 to try to reorganize their debt and save their homes. So um, on the FEMA recoupments, what do I mean by that? So a FEMA recoupment is typically um, the federal government when it issues benefits, whether it's FEMA or social security or VA benefits or some other kind of federal benefit, um, 
their databases are linked. They have data sharing agreements. So if there was a determination made by FEMA that maybe some, a particular survivor shouldn't have gotten some, some benefits from a prior disaster, the most common one we see is, is from Katrina. And then at a future date, that family has applied for a tax uh, refund or that family has been approved for a lump sum disability benefits. They, the government will take that new money that could be coming into the family to reimburse itself and to recoup for money that it has determined shouldn't have gone out in the first disaster. So it's kind of complicated, but we are still getting those faces cases. So, you know, if you are seeing that sort of in your community, that is definitely the kind of thing you can, can refer to us. So th this is just a graphic that we threw together probably about five years after Katrina to just kind of show kind of the arc of legal needs at that time. Um, so the types of issues are pretty much almost identical, but the timeline with future disasters now is a bit different. So we didn't start seeing spikes with contractor issues and successions and title issues until way in like 2007 to 2009. And part of that was because the long-term rebuilding program, the road home, didn't get stood up until way down here. And that's when the money started flowing. And that's when you needed to prove you owned your home. And once the money really gets flowing, that's when we started seeing, unfortunately, more people start having contractor issues. Um, in future disasters, these kind of issues are happening way more at the front of the cycle. Um, so I wanted to just kind of give, I've thrown a lot of information at you. So I wanted to maybe give more, a couple of examples of the kinds of real life situations that folks deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So we've got um, four different examples of real clients um, with, you know, a few things change so that we don't violate any kind of confidentiality here. So in this first example, we had Miss WW. She was a hospitality worker, worked at a, lo a local hotel in the greater New Orleans area, and she had already been pretty hard hit by the pandemic. She's a single mom supporting her nine-year-old daughter, and when the pandemic struck, she had to rely solely on unemployment assistance to help cover her bills. She ended up falling somewhat behind on her rent. Then she was called back to work, albeit at reduced hours, and she wasn't making quite enough to pay the rent. She was doing what she could. But at the time Ida hit, um, she and her daughter ended up evacuating. And at that time, she owed almost $5,000 to her landlord, um, which was the equivalent of about five months of rent in her situation. Unfortunately, her home did have storm damage. Um, and so her landlord, without notifying her, had went into the home, had thrown out a lot of her water damaged personal property and had mucked and gutted the unit or cleared out the unit. Um, so she ended up having to stay in a FEMA paid hotel for two months and then she was able to go back to her apartment. Uh, but when she did that, the landlord said, you know, he had been hurt too, of course, um, that he did all pass through rent or else he would have to evict her. So it's really, common that when housing becomes at a premium, even landlords that might have previously um, been more lenient, you know, they, they need to recover or they may have, um, there may be more of a market for housing of people that got displaced and need housing. So it can get trickier to try to resolve eviction situations. Uh, in Ms. W's case, she couldn't pay all the back rent all at once. He only wanted it all at once, and she got served with an eviction notice. So she ended up connecting with our housing law unit. She was in the New Orleans area um, after her landlord filed an eviction in court, and we worked with the city of New Orleans to expedite a rental assistance application um, for $4,778 to help her get caught up on the rent. 
We also had to negotiate with her landlord to accept the rent and not evict and uh, craft a consent judgment that was acknowledged by the court and uh, we filed that with the court. So unfortunately under Louisiana law, if the landlord doesn't want to work with you, um, they don't have to take the rent. So, but in this situation, we were able to, to work things out to help stabilize this family. Now, it's also not uncommon that um, folks have multiple legal issues going on at the same time. So another legal issue, even though she didn't know that uh, when she first came to us that we might be able to help her with her FEMA claim, um, we are still assisting her with that. So when the landlord threw her property out, um, she couldn't prove the damage to it anymore. She didn't have pictures. The stuff was gone from the side, you know, from the, in front of her home. Um, and so we are working on that claim and um, we'll see how that comes out. Hopefully we'll be successful on getting her some compensation for those items that she lost. So another example, this one's a contractor dispute for a homeowner. So in this one, uh, this particular family was um, from a more rural area in the capital area, United Way's part of um, our service area. And she was an elderly homeowner. Her home had pretty significant damage from Ida. She was having trouble finding a contractor to do the work. She wanted it done as quickly as she could because uh, she didn't want the mold to take over her house. Um, I believe she was from, from St. James Parish, if I remember. It could be Iberville, it's one of those. Um, so this is kind of astounding. Uh, she was quoted $50,000 to muck and gut her home. And this was not a mansion. We are talking a pretty basic three bedroom home for a, a low income senior. Um, she had received, did have homeowner's insurance and had received $80,000 in an insurance check to fix her home. But after that $50,000 in mucking gut cost, um, she only had $30,000 left to try to make repairs, which exceeded the cost estimate she had to finalize those repairs. So she, on her own, she asked the contractor if they would reduce those costs. She was hearing that those costs were unreasonable um, after she'd already paid them so that she could afford to fix her house. And instead of negotiating with her, the contractor filed a lien against her property and told her he was going to sue her for the balance of the contract. So she didn't know what to do. So she ended up being referred to us and we got an uh, investigation of the facts of her case. Um, and after our attorney kind of looked at the facts and, and the applicable law for her situation, determined that we had grounds to terminate the contract, to get a reduction in the muck and gut costs. She got a partial refund of those costs and uh, we took legal action to cancel the lien. So then she hired a new contractor to fix her home. And I'm happy to report that she was able to get all the repairs done and has now fully recovered from the impact of Ida. But it's pretty unusual for us to see $50,000 in mucking gut cost. <laughs> but it is not unusual for there to be contractor kind of issues going on in disaster survivor cases. So this one is um, an example of uh, a FEMA issue for a renter. So in this particular example, Rochelle uh, lived in a, an apartment and both her, the structure and the belongings were damaged by Hurricane Ida. So she ended up applying for FEMA assistance, but was told she was ineligible due to insufficient damage. And she couldn't really understand how that was possible because she had two rooms in the home that had pretty significant damage and her landlord had even told her that he needed her to move out so that he could get the unit repaired. Um, FEMA did not approve her for either rental assistance or personal property assistance. And she got a denial letter giving her 60 days to appeal. So after she got that letter, 
um, she learned about our disaster uh, helpline and the Capital Area United Way helped us make some modifications to this helpline, which is helping all of our folks throughout our service region. Um, and the United Way of Southeast Louisiana um, has also helped us with some of the uh, legal services for disaster survivors, I think in this particular case too. So this one was one where the kind of the two entities are ending up helping the same survivor uh, from an access point and a, a legal service delivery point. So after she found out about the hotline, she Googled it, she saw it, she called it. Um, she got connected with one of our disaster legal relief attorneys. Uh, we quickly got a, a, a special release form, an authorization form to allow us to talk to FEMA, to get records on her behalf. Uh, we contacted FEMA. And one of the first things we did was we made a request to have a second inspection. Um, so they came back out to the home. We also requested that the landlord who was cooperative write a letter explaining um, the situation with the property that it had in fact been damaged um, and that some of her items would, were damaged as well. Uh, so we worked up a FEMA appeal and submitted it. And shortly after FEMA received the appeal, it was probably more like 30 days to be honest, uh, um, FEMA overturned their previous denial and approved Rochelle for two months of rental assistance and personal property assistance of about $2,200. So that really helped her kind of get her footing back under her. And this last example is one which is both a disaster response type of service and the kind of thing we really need folks thinking about to help make them more resilient to a potential future disaster. So this example really falls in our um, sometimes you hear it called probate, sometimes you hear it called successions, sometimes you hear it called a family home or an air property issue. Um, air, unresolved air property is a huge barrier to people being able to access different kinds of recovery resources, but it can also um, be an area where if folks take action now, it can make future disaster recovery goes smoother. So let me roll this example out here. So in this case, we had CV uh, who was disabled, 56 years old, and had been living in uh, a family home all of his life. Um, his mom had passed away several years ago, but she'd never, the family had never taken the legal steps to legally transfer the title of the property from his mom's name to his and his siblings name. Uh, the home was pretty extensively damaged in Ida and FEMA was not providing any assistance to CV really for two reasons. One, they couldn't prove that he owned the property and also they couldn't prove that he was living there at the time of Ida. So, the thing that was complicating the proof that he was living there was that his sister had a power of attorney to help him handle some of his affairs due to his disability. Um, he had a mobility impairment in a wheelchair. It was hard for him to get around. So a few years ago, his sister had done power of attorney. Uh, and so she had set up um, like utility accounts and, um, water, sewage, that kind of things, and in electricity, but all the bills were showing in her name instead of his name. So um, he was just having trouble proving his connection to the property. So he, they ended up, family ended up calling us uh, in March of this year to see could we help them out. And two days later, we met with the client to sign his succession paperwork. One of our attorneys actually went out to the home uh, because of the mobility impairment. Um, and we were able to put together really pretty quickly uh, the documents, do an affidavit of small succession. Um, and these were the documents that FEMA needed to be able to satisfy their occupancy and ownership requirements. 
And then he was approved for almost $30,000 in, in assistance to help repair his home. So he now has legal control of the home, it is now in the name of himself and his sister. And so he's definitely going to be um, both more resilient to future disasters, but also if there are unmet cost needs to fully repair the home. Uh, and there's a long-term recovery pro program that the state rolls out. He's already going to have the proof of ownership that he is likely going to need for that long-term recovery program. So one thing I do want to kind of give a caveat here, it is pretty unusual that we're able to resolve a succession in only a few days. <laughs> Most of our clients, we're not dealing with just two siblings that have all the paperwork in order and are uh, have the capacity to very quickly um, provide all the information we need. It's much more common, especially when dealing with lower income populations, that um, families haven't dealt with legal title because there's been no real, uh, it's not a problem till it's a problem. I just put it that way. Um, and so it is very common to find that you're dealing with not just trying to resolve ownership for the person that's living in the home or was living in the home at the time of the disaster, but you may be dealing with a mother's succession and a grandmother's succession that were never opened. And you may be dealing with multiple heirs or one of the heirs passed away. And so now all their children are in their place or maybe you know who the heirs are, but you don't know where the heirs are. Uh, so it's very common for us to, in most of our cases, it may take weeks to months uh, before you can kind of try to resolve these situations. But the good news is uh, we have the resources right now. Uh, we have stood up a disaster title clearing collaborative um, with our partners at Louisiana Appleseed to really uh, focus on this systemic issue throughout our communities and holding on to your home and being able to control what happens to your home and your property is a really important part of wealth building and holding on to assets, particularly in communities of color. If you're not dealing with these issues early on, this is how people wind up losing their homes. Um, to tax sales or are um, getting liens filed on their homes because they're not able to take the steps that need to happen to determine the future of what happens with their own property. So a little bit more about how you access our services. You see how my time is doing. Okay, uh, I do wanna leave a, a few moments if there are questions or you know, try to deal with chat. Uh, so we have um, our disaster hotline, 1-844-244-7871. It's open Monday through Friday from nine to five. Um, if you're working with someone who can't really access us during those dates and times, we do have an online uh, application option. You can apply 24 hours a day, seven days a week at www.slls.org. Uh, we also are out in the community as much as possible, especially through, you know, our, our funders has helped us stand up uh, community-based legal clinics. So sometimes you will find us out in the community um, on a regular basis, or we may get asked to do kind of one-offs. We also like to, um, partner at resource fairs and that kind of thing in case you guys are involved with any of those kind of efforts and want to invite us. Um, another way that folks can access services to walk into an office. So um, we are accepting walk-ins again. Um, I would always, unless something's on fire, like a, an eviction with a very short fuse or something like that, is definitely preferable to call. Um, to make sure that we can kind of fit you in. Uh, but if someone needs to walk in for an emergency, this is our list of addresses. Uh, we are pretty much 
uh, Monday through Friday, nine to five. Uh, we have our New Orleans office at 1340 Poydras on the sixth floor. Uh, in Gretna, we're at 401 Whitney Avenue, Suite 520. Covington, I see I left off the first part of the address. It is 423 North Florida Avenue in Covington, Louisiana. In Hammond, 200 Guidry Drive in Hammond. And Baton Rouge, we're at 715 St. Ferdinand Street. And in Luling, we're at 141 Keller Avenue. Um, and, but that one, we're only there Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 9 to 2. Uh, and Homa, we're at 522 Roussel Street in Homa, Louisiana. So we love to, to partner. We hope that you, know, you can involve us potentially um, in some of your partnerships. So this is just some, some ideas. If, you know, if you're working with frontline staff and you'd like to get a presentation about legal aid or maybe a specific topic, maybe you wanna know about evictions, maybe you wanna know about FEMA appeals or, or foreclosure or contractor fraud or, or whatever the topic might be, we are glad to do that kind of presentation for your staff. Um, we, it, we've got a, we've got a lot of flyers and brochures. So if anybody is wanting some physical copies of that, um, uh, my contact information is at the end and we will, we will arrange to get those to you. Um, we have established some special referral processes for uh, agencies, so I'll tell you about those in a second. Um, we can co-host a Know Your Rights event or a Facebook Live event, either for staff or just the kind of the client community we serve. We're glad to do that as well. Um, and if you have like a resource fair and outreach event, as I mentioned earlier, we're always willing to come to those. So I'm coming back to these referral processes. Um, so one thing we have sometimes that we put in place, particularly with disaster case managers, uh, we have an email address, disasterlegal at slls.org. And that goes to a designated point of contact. So if you are dealing with a lot of survivors and you kind of want um, to send an email and have it go to a specific staff member and maybe they can provide you um, some information, maybe if you're working with a client or talk through a situation, we are always open to that. And then we recently worked with another one of our partners to take our holistic legal needs screening tool that we have. She turned, she did a QR code. I don't even quite know what that word means, but I know it's just this thing you can scan and get it either on your telephone or your computer. And it basically, helps either you with, with a client or the client themselves can go through it. Uh, it helps with that identifying legal issues. It's in plain language. It's not in lawyer speak. Um, and we gather basic information and then it gets sent by email to a designated staff person. We have been testing it out with um, Tulane Medical School, Tulane Law School and, and our organization. Uh, with some high risk patients. And so far it's working pretty, pretty well um, in helping folks identify legal issues um, and get them to potential services. I would go on that link, but I don't think it, it's working right now. We're running short of time. So here's my contact information. Um, if you need to reach out afterwards, you can reach me at ltuggle at slls.org and then you know, we'll have, um, depending upon what you're asking for, we'll probably designate a particular staff person to follow up. Um, there's some, I wanted to give you a few other potential resources. Uh, if you, if you want to know even more about disaster legal services or SLLS, you can check us out at www.sls.org uh, for other legal information on a whole a range of topics. Maybe you just want to know a little more about security deposit refunds or something. Um, that The www.louisianalawhelp.org has a lot of user-friendly, basic informational resources. Um, so a lot of basic legal info you can get there. It's open to anybody. It doesn't matter what your income is. 
anybody can access those resources. And then we are working uh, to hopefully to build out some more Louisiana specific information and resources for the National Disaster Legal Aid Resource Center. Um, and there's one here that I'm having a little trouble seeing, but I'm pretty sure, oh, okay. So uh, that's just www.lsc.org, which has some basic information about resources kind of beyond um, Louisiana and national resources. So I, we got about 10 minutes. I'm gonna do a few thank yous. I see a couple of things in the chat. Um, I really wanted to give another special thanks to both the United Way of Southeast Louisiana and Capital Area United Way. You guys both have been long-term funders of our work and, um, and support us in so many other different ways. But I do just want to point out that both the United Ways and several other foundation partners, you know, you really came in and helped support our work almost immediately after the disaster struck. And we have been really fortunate that we were notified in, on June 22nd um, that SLLS was approved for an almost $6.5 million disaster legal services grant from the Legal Services Corporation. So, you know, we're just getting notification of that. It's gonna take us a little time to, to mount up. But you know, we built into that to be able to sustain the staff that we brought on with the early foundation resources and to also expand. So that grant's gonna allow us to keep doing what we're doing and build upon it for at least three years. So it's really, really critical that we have that early investment from local foundations and both of our United Way partners have been extremely supportive of that. So we couldn't have made the differences we've made uh, without that early investment. So this is just a little more acknowledgement from some, some of our other foundation partners, uh, the Barr Foundation, the ARP, the Greater New Orleans Foundation, the Baton Rouge Area Foundation, United Way of St. Charles, Kresge, North Shore Community Foundation, and also the MacArthur Foundation. Um, so thank you guys very much. I am going to try to pop into this chat and see what's in here. Hey, Laura, I, I got a question for you that was sent uh, directly in. Sorry not to, to everybody. But, no problem. Uh, one of the questions, this is an important one around uh, timelines right now. You talked about air property. Um, this individual is asking about how much time would it take to get them their property transferred right now or to make sure it's in the right name obviously in advance of hurricane season we're already in. I hate to say this, but you know how lawyers, you, often we don't really give a straight answer, but it really depends. <laughs> um, it could be as quick as that example where it's one week, you know, somebody calls one day and a couple of days later, they're being in the documents and then we're, we're filing it. That's not typical though. So I would say it, in most of the cases we work in, it's probably going to take one to three months. And occasionally, we will get a situation where um, it might become almost impossible to resolve if there's like 50 heirs and nobody's on the same page. So the other thing that, that we're doing, in addition to just the air property issue, um, a lot of time to what we find with our clients is that there's really only that one family member that's trying to take care of the property that really is, has any interest in the property. But let's just say there's 10 heirs. So yeah, if we do the succession, what we may do at the same time, uh, sometimes those folks that are interested in the property will donate their interest in the, the person that's trying to take care of things. Um, sometimes we, people just, renounce and say, hey, I'm not interested. I want to file, you know, let me do a renunciation. Um, occasionally, you might have a buyout, but typically we find that our clients, you know, don't really have the resources to do that. But we try to concentrate the ownership as much as we can in the person that's living in the property or trying to get back into the property. Um, and then with that individual, 
we do try to talk with them about estate planning um, to help protect them from future events. So, or maybe the next property owner in the family. So, you know, do they want a will? So maybe there won't be a lot of questions about who, who's supposed to get what. Um, or do you want to do a power of attorney so that you can try to protect um, what's happening at least while um, you're still around or maybe give somebody the authority to act. So sort of that whole air property and estate planning kind of goes together. That was a very long answer. <laughs> a good, good one, though. The, the, the bottom line is, if you're this individual, if you know someone like this, it's time to start moving now to get those, to get all of that work into place and into play to make sure that you're taking care of yourself or your loved ones. Right. Uh, here's another one for you from the chat. Um, what about important paperwork? Uh, what's the important paperwork to have in that go bag to make sure that you can show proof of ownership in a, in a house or in a car? Right. So, um, I would, I would give two answers to this um, on how to have that paperwork and then what that paperwork is. So if there's a way to digitally preserve that paperwork, that is a really good thing to do. If you, you know, we know a lot of our clients may not have um, that digital literacy to do that, but if there is a way that that is on the cloud somewhere that you can access no matter where you wind up, that's always a great thing to do. Sometimes clients put things on a flash drive and just, you know, take that flash drive with them. Um, so, but, it, you know, if those kind of options are not really available, um, the kinds of things you're either going to want a copy of digitally or um, papers, you're always going to want to have, uh, if you own property, you're going to want to have your documents that show your own, own property or that you're purchasing the property. You're going to want your mortgage company information if you still have a mortgage. If you have insurance, you're going to want all your, you know, your information about your insurance policy and how you contact uh, your insurance carrier. You're going to want to have um, <clears throat> all your identity documents. So uh, your, you know, your social security cards, your birth certificates, um, your marriage licenses. Um, sometimes you might want to have certain, this kind of gets away from the property stuff, but you know, if you have special medical situations, you're going to want to have certain medical paperwork or your, you know, your COVID vaccine paperwork. Um, in terms of um, if you already have, if you're a, if you're a tenant, you're going to want your lease. You probably are going to want to have, you know, all the information where you can contact your landlord. If you've got something going on, um, if you're a small business owner or if you filed your own taxes, it's usually good to have your tax documents with you, either for your personal or your small business. Um, or, you know, maybe you don't have a small business, but just your kind of your business records. Those are some of the kind of basics. If you have a will, you're going to want to bring that will. If you have a power of attorney, you're going to want to have that power of attorney. So uh, sometimes we're able to help people rebuild do lost documents. If they've lost them in a flood or maybe they never had them in the first place, um, some ownership type documents are recorded. And a lot of the courts, most of the courts in the state that we deal with have their um, documents recorded and we're usually able to remote access those documents if they've been recorded. So when you get a will, if you decide to do a will or you have a will, uh, it's really good to record that with your local, um, could be a conveyance office or assessor's office, you know, they different areas call them different things. Some just say at the courthouse, but if that document is recorded, then it becomes easy to find if you've done a will. So it was all over the place with that one. <laughs> Any others? I've got, uh, I, I just want to be mindful of time. I want to thank, I do have another question for you and I want to ask because I want to make sure that it, uh, we get that in. But uh, I want to thank all of our, our attendees for joining us today, George and Michael for uh, welcoming our guests as well. And of course, Laura, Southeast Louisiana Services and your entire team for, for all that you do. 
we're so so grateful, folks. If you, if you have to jump, uh, we we appreciate your time and the and the moment you spent with us today. Or this final question I do have for you. Um, how about uh, one question? Does the firm help with their revocable trust? Uh, we might not do that ourselves, but we might be able to refer that to a pro bono partner. So we do have relationships with volunteer attorneys. And um, a lot of times our clients don't have trust. So we sometimes are able to refer those to pro bono attorneys who may have more experience with trust. That was a good question. And I, have, I do have one more question for you because this is topical. What about uh, any household right now that may have lost their homeowner's insurance in Louisiana? Any legal action that they can take to protect themselves now oh if they start an open claim? Any tips or advice for those folks? <laughs> That is such a tough one right now. Um, you know, unfortunately, the best advice I can give is kind of the, the same recommendations that um, um, our insurance commissioner is giving. You know, if you go on um, the insurance commissioner's website, he kind of gave out a list of five or six tips over the past week. But I will just give you this example from my own personal experience. So we were not getting dropped because the, the provider was kind of getting out of the Louisiana market. Um, a lot of insurers seem to be looking for ways to not insure as many properties in Southeast Louisiana. Um, and so we ended up getting, my, myself and my husband ended up getting a notice from an insurer um, saying that uh, they were going to drop us because they determined our roof didn't have a usable life anymore. Uh, but our roof probably, when we had it inspected from the hurricane, you know, we weren't told anything about, hey, you need a new roof. And believe me, a roofer is going to want you to pay to put a new roof on if they think you need a new roof. So we ended up having to get a letter from this roofer about how much usable life we had left in the roof and submitted to the insurers. And, and they did go ahead and reinsure the property. Then the next thing that happened, which we just received in the past two weeks, is a notice telling us that, hey, we did an inspection of your home. Of course, no one ever came in here. We did an inspection of your home and basically you need to paint. And if you don't get the house painted in 30 days, we're gonna drop your insurance. <laughs> it turns out we had just hired a painter within the past few days. So, uh, but you know, there's a lot of distressing things happening in the insurance market. So um, if, you, if it's your current insurer, as opposed to someone saying they're getting out of the market altogether, you may have some other options. And the com commissioner, uh, Louisiana Commissioner of Insurance may have some good tips and they take a lot of calls from folks. We called them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, oh, that's great info. Anything you're doing yourself, Laura, we're all going to follow suit. Uh, we're so grateful for the wealth of information you always bring to us today. Thanks to everybody who tuned in. Again, as you see, more information uh, will be shared with you, including the recording via email later today. Laura, thanks again. And folks, uh, hope you stay safe this hurricane season. We certainly hope this is just a prep for some time day down the road. But if not, start to take that action, folks. Get yourself uh, in good shape as the season is here. And, and uh, unfortunately, we have a recent reminder of, of all of the challenges we can face during long-term recovery. So Laura, thanks again. And to all of our attendees, remember folks, we have one life to live, to live better, we must live united. Thank you.